Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, please. Uh, my name is Michael Cromerty with the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in Washington. I'll be your moderator for the next panel. We're going to have a PowerPoint panel, I mean, presentation, so our other two presenters will please stay in the audience and then after our presentation, so you won't sit in front of the PowerPoint. Uh, then we'll bring you up. Our speaker will speak for 30 minutes and then our respondents for 8 to 10 minutes each. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Uh, Nurit Peled El Hernan, who is a lecturer in language education at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, specializing in the discourse in Israeli education with an emphasis on the visual and verbal presentation of Palestinians and non-Western Jews. She, um, since the death of her 13-year-old daughter in a suicide bombing in Jerusalem, she has worked to promote dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians. It's our honor to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to share with you the struggle for liberty and tolerance in the world. I'm not a religious person. But this is an important struggle for me because in the place I come from, tolerance is all but dead. And liberty of thought, of movement, of worship is the privilege of one faith only. In the place I come from, which is the holy land for the three religions represented here, Jews, Muslims, and Christians live side by side in complete disharmony and people are being killed tortured, incarcerated, and deprived of the most basic human rights just because they were born into this faith and not into the other. In the place I come from, death has absolute dominion. It is death that has created a new identity for me and has given me a voice. The voice of our biblical mother Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are not. This new identity and voice transcend nationalities, religions, and even time, and overshadow all other identities deafen, and deafen all other voices I have been given by life. My new voice and identity are not the product of forgiveness. No dead child has ever authorized me to forgive in her or his name. That is why I go around the world and I denounce the master killers of children. Politicians and army generals who never, not even on Yom Kippur, have asked to be forgiven for their crimes. None of them has ever bent his head over the grave of a child with sorrow or regret. I also blame international institutions that do not do enough to save children from these killers. I blame the Nobel Prize Committee which rewards these murderers and I blame religious leaders and institutions for not fighting Jewish, Christian and Muslim fundamentalism that fuels the ecstasy of master killers and torturers all over the world. People sometimes worry that my words may inflame hate and terror that would hurt these very institutions. But the voice of mothers has never inspired hate nor inflamed evil aspirations. Only hate and evil deeds breed hate and evil deeds. My voice is not the voice of forgiveness, but it calls for the redefinition of the camps. My camp is neither Jewish nor Israeli, but that of mothers who will never be comforted for the death of their children by the killing of other mothers' children. This voice has never been heard by politicians and generals and bureaucrats. It is time for it to be heard above all others, for this is the only voice that really understands the meaning of the end of all things, including war, and therefore the meaning of tolerance. Tolerance means having true dialogues in which differences are accepted and respected and negotiated, where talks of reconciliations are not meant to deceive or bring people to their knees. It means that it really doesn't matter to me what flag is put on which mountain, and it doesn't matter who looks where when they pray, or what type of cloth anyone wears or his or her head. It means that nothing is more important than securing a child's way to his or her school. But the human psyche, as, excuse me, scientist Richard Dawkins tells us, has two great sicknesses. 
the urge to carry vendetta across generations and the tendency to fasten group labels on people rather than see them as individuals. Those of us who suffered because of those sicknesses know that the way to fight labels is to refuse them. The way to defeat false value systems is to expose them and offer others in their stead. Therefore, sorry. How do I do that? I would like to dedicate my words. Oops. to Muataz Greca, his two-year-old son, Islam, and his brother, Muntaz, who were killed 10 days ago on the 30th of August by an American missile launched by an Israeli pilot on their way from the hospital where little Islam was treated for injuries caused during the Israeli revengeful attack on Gaza. These children were born prisoners and died prisoners in their homes, on their land, just because they were Palestinians. Frightening soldiers, high electric fences, and blocked roads, raids and ruins were the daily experience of their short life. But right now, I would like to tell them not to worry. Rest in peace, children. Everyone is equally worthy in your new world. This is the world where Israeli Jewish children dwell side by side with Muslim Palestinian children. There they lay victims of racism and greed. Their bloods have been long absorbed by the Holy Land, which has always been indifferent to blood. And all of you children are victims of deceit because the world and its lords go on living as if your blood has never been shed. Because the leaders of the world keep playing their murderous games, using you as their dice and our grief as fuel for the killing machine because children are abstract entities for generals and grief is a political tool. Today's mothers, Israeli, American, English mothers, are taught to raise their children with all the love and care in order to sacrifice them to the god of death, as if their uterus was a national or other international asset. Today's fathers are taught to urge their children to commit themselves to armies whose interests have very little to do with defense or with humanistic goals to make a better world for anybody. And when these children die for the profits of somebody else, their parents bear it with dignity and pride as they were taught. Put their dead children's photographs on the mantelpiece and sigh. He was so handsome in uniform. It is time we dare ask can anyone be handsome in the uniform of brutality? Isn't our dignity and pride misplaced? And most of all, isn't there another way? In Israel and in Palestine, there is a growing number of Jewish and Palestinian conscientious people who offer alternatives to the official racist discourse and to the anti-Arab education or try to re-educate themselves to tolerance, to dialogue, and to real brotherhoods with their, their neighbors. Such are the Israeli peace activists who together with Palestinian peace activists founded a group of veterans, combatants for peace. Such are the brave soldiers who break the silence and tell the tales. Such are the Israeli bereaved parents mentioned before who join Palestinian bereaved parents and fight for peace and reconciliation knowing what it means to pay the price of racism, greed, and megalomania. And of course, doctors and rabbis for human rights who know the value of a life worth living. But as for now, none of these people are officially acclaimed or have a say in matters of formal education. Let us hope that the popular uprising in the Arab countries and the one inspired by it in Israel will not only transcend religious and ethnic or racist differences, but will once and for all establish equality between the different groups. For some years now, I have been trying to find in Israeli school books some explanation to the question, how can young people who were educated to love their neighbor as they love themselves, kill and torture their neighbors, destroy their libraries and the hospitals, humiliate their mothers and fathers and grandfathers, and desecrate their houses of prayer, 
for no apparent reason other than their being neighbors. And in so doing, as we all heard yesterday, lose their human image. The only explanation I found is that their minds are infected not only by parents, teachers, and leaders, but by the very text they are supposed to enlighten them, to teach them about the area they live in and about their neighbors. These books, be it geography, civics, grammar, or history and literature, teach them for a very tender age to ignore, resent, and despise everything and everyone who is not Jewish. The Palestinian citizens of Israel are called in Israeli school books, as in the public discourse, Arabs, the non-Jewish population or sector, or with the demeaning label, Israel's Arabs. All these labels are meant to annihilate their distinct existence as Palestinians. The whole world, but especially the country that Israeli children are ordered to love, is divided in their school books into Jewish and non-Jewish, even agriculture, industry, the professions. Israeli children who may never meet a Palestinian or talk to one until they are drafted to the army in order to carry on the Israeli policy of occupation, learn for 12 long years that these neighbors and co-citizens are primitive, conniving, and vile, underdeveloped intruders and potential terrorists. That, const that constitute the enemy from within. They learn about the Palestinian problem and how it should be solved, but they are never shown a photograph of a Palestinian human being except in racist cartoons and blurred photographs of primitive farmers and nomads. And that only 60 years after the Jews were a problem to be solved. Let's see some evidence. Uh, this is an extract from a geographic, uh, geography uh, school books. You can read that. Uh, I'll read it for you. The Arab society is traditional and objects to changes by its nature, reluctant to adopt novelties. Modernization seems dangerous to them. They are unwilling to give anything up for the general good. This is geography. Again, geography. The struggle for water. The Palestinian Authority steals water from Israel in Ramallah. Needless to say that Ramallah is not in Israel. Uh, this icon goes all along geography book whenever there is talk about Arabs. And as you see, there's no Arab in the world, I think, that looks like that, least of all in Palestine. But it's, it's some imaginary model of a European uh, drawer or painter for Alibaba or whatever. And this represents, for the children of Israel, the neighbors who live a kilometer or two from their house. As for maps. The children of Israel learn to love their homeland, which means practically to see the whole land of Israel and Palestine as their her in heritage and to master it. On none of the maps they see in the school books and around them is there a Palestinian institute such as a university or a cultural site. Since death has absolute dominion in my country, killing is the most common means to solve religious and political differences between Jews and non-Jews. Palestinians may be eliminated upon suspicion alone, and hardly anyone is ever brought to trial for the killing of a Palestinian child. Out of more than 5,518 5, 5, cases of such murders during the years of occupation, only 173 were investigated, only 14 were brought to trial, no one is in jail. Now I'll show you a few maps. This map is interesting because it's about the Arab population in the state of Israel. As you see, the area of Palestine is depicted is an area within the state of Israel for which there is no data, which means no population. All these are population, you see? Also on these and other maps of the geography book, we don't find either Acre or Nazareth or any 
mixed city. This is university in Israel. As you can see, you have the smallest extensions of universities in the illegal settlements across the border, but you don't have even one major Palestinian state, and of course there's no sign for Palestine here. Uh, this is uh, in another geography book for fifth grade. The chapter is titled One Sea with Many Names. And you would expect to have all the names that people along the coast of the Mediterranean call it. Instead, you have uh, biblical phrases that uh, reassert our mastery of the whole area, included Lebanon, Syria, etc., etc., etc. And of course, as you see, the country, the whole country, is ours. Uh, when talking about Palestinian nationality, it's when it is talked about. Usually it is not talked about. These two books are considered far more progressive than others. It is talked about in irony and sarcasm. This is one sentence. In a chapter called the Palestinians from Refugees to a Nation, we read the longing and the subhuman conditions of exile in down the land of Israel with an image of paradise lost. Of course, the Palestinians yearn for Palestine and not for the land of Israel. As I was saying, in Israeli school books, the killing of Palestinians by the Israeli army is presented as necessary evil. And it's usually labeled operation, reaction, punitive action, or appropriate response and is legitimated by its short or long-term effects for the Jews, such as the need to maintain a coherent Jewish state with a Jewish majority, or the security of the Israeli Jewish citizens. The Israeli students learn throughout their school years that any evil done to them may be condoned if it prevents a greater or lesser evil done to us. For example, uh, this is um, from a recent book studied today and highly recommended by the Ministry of Education. After the massacre of Kibya, which was performed by Ariel Sharon as his notorious 101 unit, in which a whole village was demolished on its inhabitants as a revenge for the killing of a woman and two children, in Yahud, which is a cleansed Palestinian village repopulated by Jews. But the killers did not come from Kibia. They came from another village, Rantis. Only Kibia was more comfortable to destroy. The book says that this massacre and other reprisals restored the morale and dignity to the army and helped it become a deterring, vigorous army whose long arm can reach the enemy deep in its own territory. Uh, another book says that it uh, restored the confidence of the citizens. Uh, the massacre of Deir Yassin in 48 is usually uh, justified by the fact that it helped create a Jewish sequence from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And of course, uh, it accelerated the massive flight of Palestinians, which enabled the constitution of a Jewish state with a Jewish majority. So here is one quote. Its most crucial effect was in the short run. Although it did not inaugurate the massive escape of Israel's Arabs, which had started before, it had nevertheless accelerated it greatly. And this is very positive in Israeli terms. The escape of the Arabs solved an awesome demographic problem, and even a moderate person, such as the first president, Weizmann, spoke about it as a miracle. So always at the end of the chapter, the children know that the killing of Palestinians 
is legitimated as long as you can find some consequences that retrospectively can justify it. Uh, by the way, during the raids on Gaza uh, three years ago, we heard the same argument. Yeah, unfortunately, but ah, this is it. It is time to tell Jewish people in America and in Europe that it is the Israeli government, its education, and the action of its army and mind-infected soldiers, not some primordial hatred for the Jewish race, which are the reasons for the invention of the new sign we often see in demonstrations where the Star of David is equated with the swastika. Although I speak of education of Israeli boys and girls, this is not an Israeli affair, because as you know, the epidemic is worldwide. And I'll give you an example, small example. My nephew, who lives in California, came home on Halloween when he was seven and said he wanted to be a soldier and then go to Iraq and save America. How many American young men in ignorant as he was of the absurdity of this statement, actually went to Iraq or to Afghanistan and died there without knowing why, but with the word Save America on their lips. And yet, who would ever blame Judaism or Christianity for the oppression and massive killing of Palestinian, Iraqi, and Afghan children? Who would blame the people who support American, European, and Israeli crimes against Muslims all over the world, who send their children to fight these ruthless, useless wars in the name of democracy and freedom, and excuse themselves with some imaginary clash of civilization? The Western world today is infected with fear of Islam, and especially of the Muslim womb. As we heard before, demographic problem, demographic uh, uh, nightmares and so on. Americans are almost unanimous in the belief that it was Islam as a religion with all its hundreds of millions adherents that destroyed the Twin Towers. Great France of Liberté, Galité, Fraternité is scared of little girls with scarves on their head. And the Jewish democratic state of Israel holds millions of Palestinians hostages because they are not Jewish. However, as we know, neither Judaism nor Islam, nor any other religion for that matter, is the cause for the aggression of armies and the acts of terror committed by those who have no armies. Although all those killers use religion and the words of fundamentalists, priests, and rabbis to justify their crime. The cause for aggression is racism and greed, racist education, imperialism, and ruthless regimes of occupation. I know it is a terrible task, terribly hard task for people who were educated in Israel and in the USA or in any other Western democratic country to admit we were raised on heterophobia, on fear of the other, fear that is enhanced by ignorance and lack of communication. Aziz was speaking before, he said he never met Israelis that were not soldiers or settlers. Now he was growing up in a neighbor inside Jerusalem. It's not a distance between one American city and the other. It's less than half a kilometer from the next Jewish neighborhood. It is hard to admit that women who live out there in enemy regions, close as they may be or far as they may be, are mothers like us. It is very hard for Israeli mothers, for example, to believe that when Palestinian mothers lose a child, even if it's one of 12, their pain is equal to mine. Uh, I'm sorry. The only difference is that in addition to losing their children, they also lose their dignity, their homes, and their livelihood because the world does not listen to their grief and does not punish their murderers. Their cry is not heard in any courtroom. 
in order to remedy this sort of racism. I should suggest that Palestinian mothers of Gaza would be honored by all the religious authorities which do not do enough to stop fundamentalism. They should be glorified by the international institutions that do not do enough to save their children or stop the construction of apartheid walls that turn the Holy Land into one big or rather two ugly and depressing ghettos. And they should be rewarded by the Nobel Prize Committee for perseverance, for courage, for supervising their children's education to the light of candles and cell phones after the occupying powers have cut the electricity and for hurrying to prepare sandwiches when they see the bulldozers coming to demolish their houses. I don't know if you heard about it, probably not, but um, first prize in uh, Palestinian uh, matriculation exams, which are very, very hard, and I'm sure uh, you know how hard they are. They took the Jordanian uh, matriculation. First prize was awarded to a girl in Gaza who studied for her examinations to the light of her cell phone. Let me finish by suggesting that we who were children in the 60s, some of you weren't even born, should all ask forgiveness of our children for not being more alert, for not keeping a promise to make a better world for them for not teaching them how to refuse the orders of power, and for letting be them be the victims of a xenophobic education that has nothing to do with the high values of the cultures and the scriptures we pretend to honor and obey. I'd like to end this speech by a quote from a poem written by the late Hanoch Levin, one of Israel's greatest playwrights. He wrote this in the 70s. Dear Father, when you stand on my grave, old and tired and very lonely, and you see how they bury me in the ground, ask me to forgive you, Father. Thank you. <laughs>